Welcome everyone to today's webcast entitled Conducting Culturally Humble Rehabilitation Research. Our presenters today are Drs. Angel Sander, Allison Clark, and Monique Papadis from the Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Developing Strategies to Foster Community Integration and Participation for Individuals with Traumatic Brain Injury. This webcast will address topics such as the informed consent process, language and cultural issues, communication, study retention, and compensation as it relates to research with traditionally underserved communities, such as racial and ethnic minorities and the medically underserved. I'm your host, Anne Outlaw, and I'm with the Center on Knowledge Translation for Disability and Rehabilitation Research, which is funded by the National Institute for Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. We're based at CEDL, an affiliate of American Institutes of Research in Austin, Texas. We have information that accompany today's webcast on our website. These include a PowerPoint file and a text description of the training materials. Please remember that these materials are copyrighted, and you must contact our presenters to ask permission to use any of this information. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters, Angel Sander. PhD, is an associate professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Baylor College of Medicine, and is director of the Division of Clinical Neuropsychology and Rehabilitation Psychology. She's also the director of the Tier Memorial Hermans Brain Injury Research Center and the project director for the Neidler funded RRTC on developing strategies to foster community integration and participation for individuals with traumatic brain injury. She has extensive experience working with people from racially and ethnically diverse backgrounds, both clinically and in research. Allison Clark, PhD, is an assistant professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Baylor College of Medicine and research scientist at the Brain Injury Research Center at Tier Memorial Hermann. She is the director of training for the RTC that developed this webcast and a co-investigator for the Texas Traumatic Brain Injury Model System of TIER. Dr. Clark is trained as a clinical neuropsychologist and has significant experience implementing cognitive rehabilitation inter interventions with ethnic and racial minority populations and the medically underserved. Monique Papadis, PhD, is an assistant professor in the Division of Rehabilitation Sciences. School of Health Professions at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, or UTMB. And she's an investigator at the Brain Injury Research Center of TIER, Memorial Hermann. She was recently named a UTMB Pepper Center Research Career and Development Core Scholar, and she works as a Spanish-speaking case coordinator for this RRTC. And she has 13 years of experience working with racial and ethnic minority and Spanish-speaking populations in the medical and research settings. Angel, are you ready to begin? I am. I'd like to acknowledge the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, who provided the funding for all of the research that we're going to discuss today and also for this webcast. I'm going to start off with an overview of the concept of cultural competency and humility. And this is especially important in the United States because about a third of our citizens are non-European. And this number is expected to increase dramatically over the next 10 to 20 years. And unfortunately, minorities in the United States are disproportionately represented among cases of disability. So for example, African Americans and Hispanics are overrepresented in the populations of persons with stroke, spinal cord injury, and traumatic brain injury. In terms of overall cultural competence, it refers to the ability of systems to provide care to patients who have diverse values, beliefs, and behaviors. And it also involves tailoring service delivery to meet these patients' needs at the levels of social, cultural, and linguistic needs. Now, multicultural competency consists of different components. And one is your own attitudes and beliefs about other people, their cultural backgrounds. 
and sometimes their own beliefs. So our beliefs about what other people believe are important in determining how we interact with them. Also, our knowledge about different cultures, what their belief systems are, and what their different backgrounds are, and how they influence their behaviors, also influence how we interact with people from diverse backgrounds. And skills is another important component of multicultural competency. So we can possess a lot of knowledge about cultural backgrounds, but if we don't understand how to apply that knowledge in our everyday interactions with people, then our research won't be successful. And NIH defines cultural competence as a combination of a body of knowledge, a body of beliefs, and also a body of behavior. So this um, reflects nicely onto the definition that I just presented. Now, Turvalon and Murray Garcia say that cultural competence is not a discrete endpoint. So we can never reach the point in which we're entirely cultural, co culturally competent. So we can possess certain knowledge about different cultures and their backgrounds and their belief systems, but people's the influence of culture on people is constantly changing. So it's never going to be the case that we as research professionals have a complete knowledge of how culture affects a particular person that we're interacting with. So instead of cultural competence being a discrete endpoint, it's a lifelong process. And it requires commitment on our part and also active engagement at all points in our interaction with people. So it's a lifelong process that individuals enter into on an ongoing pace, basis with patients, communities, colleagues, and also with themselves. So it's an, an important component of cultural competence is to know yourself, your limitations, and what your beliefs are about other people of different diverse backgrounds. So because of that, because of the fact that competence is not an endpoint but a commitment to a lifelong engagement, a way of thinking, some people have suggested that in a more appropriate term is cultural humility. And cultural humility is the process of understanding and having an accurate view of your own self, your own belief systems, and then being able to maintain an interpersonal stance that is other-oriented rather than self-focused. So rather than operating from your own belief system, allowing yourself to understand the belief systems of another person, which requires actually listening to that person and perceiving that person as the expert regarding their own environment, their own cultural background, and the effect that all of those have had on them. Cultural humility is characterized by a lifelong commitment to self-evaluation and self-critique, and also a desire to fix power imbalances. So we as researchers come into a situation, let's say we're interviewing a person with a disability, there's automatically a perceived power imbalance there in many situations. So the person who's being interviewed may perceive the person interviewing them as an expert. They may have issues of mistrust with regard to research, the research situation. And we need to be aware of that and understand that the way that we present ourselves to that person that we're interviewing can make the difference between whether we're going to get accurate information from that person and get a true understanding of the impact of disability on their lives, or whether they may just be telling us what we want to hear because they perceive that we're an expert with certain belief systems. Also, cultural humility is characterized by developing partnerships with people and with groups who advocate for others. So one way of reaching out to people of whatever background we want to represent is by showing that we are engaging with them by partnering with community organizations that they are part of and that help us to understand our culture better. The idea of cultural humility is that there's really no need to master the health beliefs or any other beliefs of a particular group. So of course, as professionals, we want to be as informed as we can about the backgrounds and belief systems of certain groups 
And so it is important to take courses on cultural competency, to take courses on the belief systems of particular groups of people, like maybe Asian Americans or Hispanics. But there's also a danger if we look at this knowledge as more than just a piece of knowledge that exists in a certain time, and that could evolve and change over time. So for example, if you have a belief system about a person's reaction to pain, and you think, OK, well, I learned something in a class that says that Asian Americans have a tendency to focus on their pain when they you know, when they feel pain to, to focus very much on it, then you may interact with that person very differently in a rehabilitation setting than if you understood that each person's experience of pain may be influenced somewhat by their culture and what you learned in your course, but also by various other aspects of their culture that you may not be familiar with and that you can't learn in a single course. So everyone has multiple cultural ro roles, and all of those interact to influence their behavior and their belief system at a certain point in time. So for example, at one point in time, a man may have a role as a Mexican-American, as a, a male gender role, as a father, a husband, a Catholic, a mechanic, a night school student, and a resident of Los Angeles. So when you think of each person as an individual that plays many different roles. And all of these roles can be perceived as their culture. And that culture then influences them in a particular moment. You can see that we can never really have a complete knowledge of a person just because we took a class on you know, belief systems of Hispanic Americans regarding health. So it's important that when you interact with someone, you consider them to be the expert of their own experience. So when we conduct cultural humility and research, we need to be aware of our own patterns of beliefs, including stereotypes. We need to be open to hearing the lived experience of the person that we're interacting with. And we need to consider them to be the expert of their own lives and cultures. And reflecting back on what I said about power imbalances, this really puts power back into balance. Because we are experts in many things as researchers, but we are not experts on the lives or culture of the person that we're interacting with. So they are bringing in a certain expertise as well. And it's important to step away from our past experiences and knowledge when we're approaching a new participant or a new group. So you know, we may, I may have interviewed five Hispanics who had a certain belief, and then I go into interviewing another Hispanic person, and I assume that they're going to have that same belief when, in fact, they do not. So again, listening, being open to the person, and viewing them as the expert on their own beliefs and their own culture. So that's the background on conducting culturally humble research. And now Monique is going to discuss specifics in terms of different aspects of the research process, including recruitment, consent, and data interpretation. OK, so now um, I will discuss, um, you know, tying back into what Dr. Sander mentioned uh, regarding culture. Uh, when, you know, when you hear the word culture, I want you to think about, you know, what comes to mind. Um, so culture can include many things. It can include, you know, how we um, live, our role um, expectations, um, our norms, um, you know, how we raise our children, uh, any rituals or traditions that we may have, our attitudes about time, money, um, concepts of beauty, art, music, food, and entertainment. So it can be a whole um, host of other things that can uh, include, compass, include what is uh, culture, excuse me. So diversity. Uh, can consist of many different types of dimensions. So you, you can have these internal dimensions, which are things that, you know, generally we are born with or that, um, you know, we cannot necessarily change. Um, and those things can include um, things like your age, race or ethnicity, um, physical abilities and qualities, 
um, things such as your national origin, uh, and even gender identity or expression. And then other um, particular dimensions that may exist or that we can acquire or, ch or that can change over time um, in our lives is things like religious beliefs, marital status, education, your appearance, um, and political beliefs. So the combination of all these different layers or dimensions um, can influence our values, it, it can influence our beliefs, our behaviors, our experiences and expectations and make us all unique as individuals. So as far as uh, when we speak of culturally sensitive research, um, Henderson has a, a great quote that culturally sensitive research is not research just about another culture, but it's research done with a raised consciousness concerning the impact of culture on the person and or the phenomena being studied um, on the research process itself and on the actual researcher as well. And then Ruben and Babby also um, mentioned about, you know, what is culturally sensitive research. And their take on it is that you have to be um, aware of and appropriately respond to the ways in which cultural factors and cultural differences can influence all stages of the research process. So, you know, how cultural, you know, similarities or differences or just general factors can um, impact what we investigate, such as our general research topic, how we investigate it, our methodology, and then how we analyze and interpret our findings. And so what is culturally competent uh, research? So culturally competent research is basically factoring in culture, language, and diversity into all the different aspects of uh, <clears throat> the research process. So for example, OK, this not, uh -oh. okay. so for example, with uh, data planning, so in this part, um, you know, you have to factor in how culture and language and diversity can impact, you know, your research question or topic, um, but also you choosing the setting and the participants and, and the sample that you wish to recruit um, and any other cultural language or um, other factors that may impact that process. And then when it comes to implementation, um, things such as, um, measurement, choosing which measures that uh, you will have um, or use. For example, there are not many validated measures uh, in non-English speaking languages. So um, for example, Spanish um, that has been, have not been validated. And there may not be norms available if you're using specific uh, type of measures in a research or um, research setting. And so those things you have to consider when you're doing or trying to conduct uh, culturally competent research. And also acknowledging the setting of where um, the research will take place. Will it be at the research center? Will it be at a participant's home? And factoring that in, if it's at the research center, are you acknowledging that certain groups may have difficulty with trans obtaining transportation? Um, and, and that may impact whether or not they participate in the research or not. And then another step is, of course, a data analysis. So much of the research uh, is often viewed as culturally insensitive um, because it, it's most of the time racial differences or are not analyzed, or even gender differences are not analyzed. Um, racial, uh, ethnic, and racial groups are kind of are usually uh, lumped together as one minority group, and compared to the majority. Well, that's insensitive, culturally insensitive research. Um, the idea is that because minorities can be so diverse just within that particular group, and so you may miss or 
misinterpret the results just based off of that information. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, for example, Asian Americans have um, higher levels of academic achievement than Caucasians, whereas other minorities may have lower or um, lower academic achievement. Well, if you lump Asian Americans with uh, African Americans or Hispanics um, in comparison to Caucasians, that is masked. The differences could um, be masked. And so it may appear that overall all of them together have a different ac academic achievement than Caucasians, but in reality, if you really look at the um, different subgroups of uh, minority groups, um, you know, the, your theory may not be true. And so interpreting ethnic differences in a um, prejudicial manner, like focusing too much on the deficits of minorities and too little on the strengths. Um, just an example of uh, a work that we've done with the RRTC, um, we found that ethnic minorities um, have lower community integration than um, Caucasians. Well, um, again, that may tie into the actual definition of what is cultural uh, community integration, whereas ethnic minorities may place more emphasis on um, socializing with family and friends um, than the Caucasians. And then the next thing um, with translation, again, after uh, just disseminating the, the information, um, and also it's really important to the information that you obtain in your research, taking it back to uh, the individuals and disseminating that information um, that you obtain and also including them uh, in that process of interpretation and dissemination. So when you're training culturally competent investigators, um, it's good to provide training and resources that assess these four different um, cultural uh, concepts of cultural awareness, cultural knowledge, cultural sensitivity, and competence. So, um, you know, with regards to awareness, it's important to help members of a multicultural team recognize the need to examine their own cultural values, their own beliefs and practices in order to reduce the risk of cultural bias. And then also take that information and also build your cultural knowledge and try to learn a bit more about other cultural cultures and countries. And information is easily found on the internet and books on different culture, cultures. And you can also ask your colleagues and start to build some sort of cultural awareness. And so with regard to sensitivity, focusing on ways of avoiding insensitivity and establishing trust and rapport in order to facilitate accurate assessment, diagnosis, and the delivery of holistic, culturally appropriate care or research. And then lastly, um, it all, three, all three, awareness, knowledge, and sensitivity tie into um, gaining some form of cultural competence where you're able to practice the awareness, knowledge, and sensitivity skills in various settings. So now I'll discuss how language is really important in research and, and the cultural barriers in uh, research. So illiteracy and health um, illiteracy, it's really important, even though you're working with an uh, English-speaking population, it's really important to assess um, the participants' literacy um, and also health literacy, because that can um, affect you during the informed consent process. Um, it can affect if you're asking them to complete measures, uh, if they're not able to understand the assessment. Uh, and then also with regards to health literacy, understanding um, if you know, they have a particular disability or condition or illness, um, for them to be able to understand uh, what that is and how that may impact um, the research process. Also, working with individuals with limited English proficiency and having translators, a big uh, problem is that they're, even though um, 
uh, to this day, you know, there are a lot of uh, Spanish-speaking individuals in the United States, but there's still a lack of available translators um, and that are available to do the translation. And so that's a, a big barrier. And many individuals or groups um, do not have the ability to obtain translators, and so therefore um, aren't uh, in the position to be able to recruit um, non-English speaking individuals. And that's a, a, a barrier in research. And then all, as I mentioned before, there's a lack of uh, availability of validated measures um, in target populations languages. And then also lack of normative data. And then uh, with regard to response set bias, in certain groups, um, when you have a Likert scale, that goes from strongly agree to strongly disagree, um, certain groups may not uh, report that they strongly agree some, uh, a certain way or strongly disagree a certain way, but they may just state that they agree or disagree. And so if you have a measure that has that Likert scale going from strongly agree to strongly disagree, you may have a re response set bias if you do not probe and find out um, you know, the reason why they may only be choosing those options instead of um, having the option of saying strongly agree or disagree. And then um, it's, as far as uh, linguistic competence, um, it is important for your data collection team to have, you know, to include bilingual or bicultural um, staff members or multicultural group, um, be able to provide foreign language interpretation, sign language interpretation if needed, um, using easy to read or low literacy written materials. So um, a statement from the AHRQ is that Linguistic competence is being able to provide readily available, culturally appro appropriate oral and written language services to limited English proficiency members through such means as bilingual and bicultural staff, trained medical interpreters, interpreters and qualified translators. So as far as techniques when working with individuals with di the, from diverse backgrounds, and some of these could just apply just in general uh, with techniques and converse having conversation with others, but being able to establish rapport with others, um, pay attention to the nonverbal cues, and um, use the language of the participants, um, and in person before disability uh, language. So if you're working with a person with brain injury, you would say person with brain injury instead of the brain injured person. And then cultural, use cultural terms accepted by the participants. Um, <clears throat> and this can be even uh, with the identification of their race. Um, it's important to let them explain to you how they want to be classified versus you automatically assuming that the person would like to be called Asian or would like to be called Hispanic or even African American. And then avoid stereotyping and use culturally sensitive questions instead of saying things like, what spiritual uh, beliefs do you have? You can say, can you help me understand your spiritual or religious beliefs? Or, you know, um, why are you stressed? What are other stressful situations you have experienced? How did you deal with them to kind of get an idea of their coping uh, methods that they use? And what do you know about TBI? How do you think TBI affects someone? Those are uh, questions where it, it elicits them to give a response to you so that you can find out from their perspective and their beliefs versus um, otherwise. And then when it comes to using interpret interpreters, it's really important um, that you speak directly to the participant. Uh, many times this does not happen. Um, it's kind of uh, normal in conversation for you to look at the person that's speaking. And so if the interpreter is the one speaking and, and 
and you're speaking to the interpreter, you're only looking directly at that person. But it's really important that you look directly at the participant, um, and you can still have the same conversation with the interpreter, but it's important so that they can feel like they are a part of the conversation. And ask the interpreter to not paraphrase. Um, introduce everyone and be sensitive and pause often so that the interpreter can get all the information that's needed to translate back to the participant. And make sure that you give interpreter um, time to translate. I know I've translated for others and they spit out five, ten sentences before I've even translated the second sentence. And so avoid technical tr jargon if you can. Uh, sometimes it's, you can't avoid it. But if, can, if you can, um, try to use uh, words that um, are uh, not too technical or, or medical. And then avoid side conversation with the interpreter in front of the participant, because then they will think that you're um, talking uh, about them in a negative way. And then cultural barriers in, in research. Um, it is well known that in research um, there's an underrepresentation of, of certain groups. Those groups include racial and ethnic minorities, women, children, and the elderly. So it's really important if you want to uh, be able to adjust for these potential um, cultural barriers that you try to, if possible, oversample for these particular groups um, as they are often uh, not represented in the um, overall uh, sample. And then also sometimes you have to factor in socioeconomic status. It's not um, appropriate just to look for racial or ethnic differences, um, but also factor in possible socioeconomic status. Um, because we've, in some of the research that we found, that has been uh, more predictive than actual race and ethnicity. And then rule settings is a, a big barrier. Many times it's difficult for them to participate in research or even gain access to medical care. Um, so any way to also include research or uh, in, include that particular population in research is, would be beneficial and culturally um, uh, competent. And then also factoring in things like acculturation and immigration experience, um, inclusion of a diverse research team, as I mentioned before, and then lack of familiarity with the targeted population is a big cultural barrier. And then again, culturally insensitive data analysis and interpretation can affect the research process as well. So what are some considerations, that um, things that you should consider uh, when you're recruiting individuals from diverse uh, backgrounds? Number one is address issues of confidentiality. Many uh, groups, and not just lumping people into groups, but many individuals are um, you know, shy away from research because of the fear of their information uh, being shared with others. So addressing issues of confidentiality can help uh, ease the uh, process of recruiting individuals that may have um, that fear. And then also including commun community members throughout the research process. Um, a lot of times that you gain more insight by these individuals from the community, which can help you gain access to the population and also help you um, with regards to uh, procedures if uh, you notice that you're having a difficulty uh, recruiting uh, a certain group or certain individuals from a particular neighborhood um, by having a community member from that neighborhood may help um, that particular barrier. And then also appropriate compensation and no coercion. If you're in, uh, recruiting individuals that you know, may not have an employment, have employment or a job, um, using um, you know, compensation is not appropriate to try to recruit those individuals. If uh, they are given $100, for example, for uh, participating in the research, that sounds very uh, good to someone that, that may not be working. And so um, constantly focusing on the compensation aspect of the research um, is a form of coercion and should not be done. 
and then address issues of transportation and child care barriers. I know for many of the studies that we've completed through the RRTC, uh, we've paid for taxis and um, for individuals that lack transportation. And so you should consider that as well. And then again, with having culturally competent interviewers, it's great to have um, you know, the racial ethnic makeup that's consistent with um, the groups that you're recruiting, um, the competence level and experience of those interviewers, again, having bilingual or bicultural staff, and then having individuals truly understand cultural, how cultural factors can influence their participation in research. So in the informed consent process, it's important that to stress that participation is voluntary. Try not to use medical or technical jargon. Um, again, assess their literacy and um, make sure that they understand the information that you share to them about the study. Address confidentiality concerns and be honest about the benefits and costs of the research. Many times there are no direct benefits to participation. However, many individuals enjoy uh, participating in research if they know that the information may actually benefit another person. Okay, and then um, as I mentioned already, it's important to assess the literacy and level of comprehension of the consent form and the process um, and the procedures for the research. Also, language of consent uh, is very important, making sure that um, it's uh, not a lot of technical uh, jargon and also uh, using words. Um, oftentimes, uh, institutional review boards will want the consent form to be in eighth grade or sixth grade uh, reading levels. And then knowing who should or should not sign is very, very important. Um, even though in one study, I'll give an example, uh, there was um, the wife did not want to sign for her husband, even though she completely agreed with the research and, and wanted her husband to participate. Um, but the uh, cultural factor of because her husband was the one who always made all of the decisions, she did not feel like um, she didn't feel comfortable with signing the consent form. So again, that ties into her cultural beliefs and then the gender norms that they have for that particular family. And the decision to consent may be a family decision, even though the person may be able to sign and consent for themselves. Oftentimes, the whole family, if the whole family wants to participate, then that's when the person will sign. And a lot of times, you have to take that into consideration. So again, you must respect cultural and gender role norms during the consenting process. And then the last um, few parts are regarding uh, retention and consider retention of uh, study participants. So uh, what we've learned is that transportation and, and child care barriers may still exist. But again, uh, factoring in things if there's um, financial resources available to be able to pay for individuals' transportation or <clears throat> conduct the research in the participants' homes, that helps with uh, retaining uh, research participants. And also, the accessibility of research setting must, be still, must still be considered. And then it's really important to use frequent and individualized context and personal touches. Um, this could uh, be just checking on them, how are they doing, um, stating, letting them know that it's their anniversary, their birthday, little things like that truly makes an impact and want uh, research participants to keep in contact with the researcher. And also, what has always helped me is maintaining contact information on family and friends because many times individuals may change addresses or change telephone numbers. But if you have a documentation of their extended family and also close friends whom they uh, maintain contact, um, then that's another form or way to be able to keep in touch with them. 
And then lastly, uh, with many individuals uh, using social media and texting and emails, um, those are another form of contact um, that is frequently used because uh, there's been times where individuals may not have had a telephone, but they had access to things such as Facebook um, and other social media sites. Um, and that also uh, can be a, a form of recruitment, or not recruitment, excuse me, of retaining uh, research participants. Okay, so now I'm going to shift to speak a little bit about the implementation of the research. Um, what happens once um, someone has been enrolled in a study? Um, I'd like first to address just some general considerations in intervention research, and then I will discuss issues and considerations when implementing interventions in the home setting. Uh, first, it's really important to clarify for all participants potential participants the differences between their clinical care and research. Uh, because the researcher's initial contact with that person and his or her subsequent participation in a project may be that person's first and only exposure to research. And so they may not appreciate the differences between research interventions and interventions done during the course of their regular clinical care. So it's important to just kind of remind people throughout the study, again, that participation in this study will not impact the care that they receive from their doctors, and that they still have access to all the same health services regardless of their participation. Again, participation is voluntary, and then they can drop out of the study at any time without penalty. Uh, it's also really important to understand, again, that some persons may be suspicious of research and have concerns that they are being taken advantage of in some way. Uh, indeed, there were infamous research projects such as the Tuskegee syphilis experiment in which participants were not fully informed about all aspects of the projects and where researchers withheld important information from participants that negatively impacted their health. Um, and these abuses that were done in the name of research uh, have led to the current federal laws and regulations about the protection of human subjects in research, and all researchers are responsible for complying with these regulations. So transparency about all aspects of the project is important to address these concerns. And this requires open and clear responses to all questions from participants and, and their family as well about how people were identified in the first place um, for this particular project, say, that you're trying to recruit for, why certain questions are being asked, what will be done with the information that is being collected, and how the researchers will be protecting their privacy. Uh, intervention research, you know, also really demands flexible scheduling. Again, participation is voluntary, so it's really important to appreciate all the demands on participants' times uh, and to work around their work schedules, their school schedules, and their child care responsibilities. Uh, and so a lot of times that means being willing to conduct these intervention studies on weekends and evenings as needed. Um, you know, inquiring about communication preferences is also key, as Dr. Papadis mentioned. Again, many of us have various ways that we can be contacted, such as cell phone, email, text message, voicemail. And we all have preferences about how we want to be contacted. And indeed, my experience has been over the past few years, um, an increasing number of participants have requested, um, especially the younger adults that I work with, that they be contacted via text message and state that they are more likely to respond to a text message than listen to a voicemail and then respond to a voicemail. Um, and again, this is really key for intervention studies because appointments need to be confirmed, sometimes changed, especially when they're done in these um, off hours. So establishing communication preferences from the very beginning um, and respecting those can help with retention over time. So at our research center, at our RRTC, we have conducted um, intervention studies in the home setting, uh, including interventions aimed at expectations regarding alcohol and substance use following TBI and improving functional memory performance after TBI. And there are several benefits associated with implementing interventions in the home setting. Uh, conducting interventions in the home setting can really promote cultural humility. Um, it communicates a respect for the participants uh, and, for the and for their environment, for their home environment, for their family environment. And so it really, I think, provides a more holistic understanding um, from re um, researchers to 
really appreciate the lived experience of their participants, what their goals are, what their challenges are, what their barriers are, and what are their strengths as well. What are their family strengths? What are their personal strengths? What are their community strengths? Um, another advantage is, is that it really allows us, when you're implementing these interventions in the home setting, that they can be really be tailored to really fit that home setting, because everyone's home setting is so different. And that can then further promote generalizability and then um, transfer of those skills to other tasks. And finally, it really reduces transportation issues. Um, persons may have, you know, not have reliable transportation. Um, you know, gas prices go up and down. There's costs associated with parking, costs associated with taking time off of work. So doing the intervention in the home setting can actually um, reduce all those costs, reduce those issues, and then promote um, the participation and, ret again, retention over time. So again, just some general considerations in the home settings versus the clinical settings. Um, it's really, you know, when someone's coming in to see us in the clinic, a lot of time it's just that person that you're working with. Um, you know, they're coming into your office, um, and you're doing the intervention in, in the kind of an office environment, which is a lot of times just one-on-one. -on -one. Whereas when we're doing the interventions in the home setting, it's actually uncommon, in my experience, has been for, their, for them to be the only person in the home at that time. So a lot of time there's other family members in the home. These may be the parents of the person with their injury, siblings, their minor children, um, friends, sometimes neighbors. So you kind of never know who else is exactly going to be there in the home. So you need to be prepared for um, questions and concerns, not just from the participant about the research project, but everyone else who is also in the home. And also kind of getting permission from the potential participant to discuss these things in front of the person, again, because there are, there are privacy and confidentiality concerns that I'll talk about um, in a little bit. And these questions sometimes may not just have to do with the research project, but may have to do with just accessing you know, other resources and care. Because again, because you're, when you're coming from the medical center, a medical setting, so they may have questions about their clinical care. Um, and even though you're there for a research purpose, you still may get these questions about clinical care, and you should be prepared to answer those questions um, and to refer participants to the appropriate resources. And finally, just some just basic logistical considerations as well to consider in home settings and community settings. Just basic things like, you know, where should I park, and where are we going to conduct this particular assessment? Some people, um, you know, I do things outside if that's what the participant is most comfortable with. So as I mentioned before, you know, there are some issues with privacy and confidentiality that you need to think about when you're doing assessment and treatment sessions, treatment, excuse me, assessment and treatment in the home setting. Again, because it's not, a lot of times, it's not just the person that you're enrolling into the project that's there, but as well as, but there may be, like I said, other family members, parents, siblings, and minor children. And with our particular project, you know, we are asking questions about, um, you know, subjects that are very personal, highly sensitive, sometimes including questions about psychiatric history, specifically things like diagnosis and treatment, um, alcohol and substance use, sometimes legal issues. Um, and so we, you know, we remind people of these things and, and, and ask them um, about where would be a good place for us to, do, to ask these questions um, and also make sure that people understand, again, remind them about the limitations on confidentiality, um, specifically if, they're, if you know, the researcher learns of abuse or neglect of a child or an older adult in the GD to report that to authorities. And so it's really important, again, to, to restate um, those, those issues and to just remind participants at the beginning of where, where's a good place for us to do this. Again, today I'm going to be asking you some background questions, including, you know, questions about your psychiatric history and questions about substance use, and kind of let them take the lead. Um, and also communication with the family members. How are you going to communicate um, with others who are there, specifically if they speak another language? Um, I do not speak Spanish, but I understand a little bit of Spanish, and I always in inform participants and, and their family members of that so, um, so that they're not surprised if you know, I'm able to respond to something that um, a family member may have said who was in Spanish, so they don't feel like I'm kind of withholding some sort of information. Um, you know, but I openly say I can't speak it, and I only stand, understand a little bit, and I explicitly say what I can and cannot understand. Um, and again, always maintaining eye contact with the person who is speaking, um, even if you don't speak the language. And again, as I was kind of alluding to about before, again, in the home settings, um, compared to clinical settings, again, 
we as researchers do not have the control in home settings that we can maintain in a clinical setting. So if someone is coming into my office, you know, I can turn off my phone. I can, you know, sh shut down the computer so you can really minimize distractions. But a lot of times that is just not possible in the home setting. Um, so you may have a lot of distractions ranging from children, pets, doorbells, neighbors coming by, um, you know, phones, any, any and everything can be a distraction, which can make, which requires again domain flexibility on the part of the researcher. Um, and again, being conducting things in atypical settings. So again, things like outside. Um, I've done things in garages. I've done things on back porches. Um, another issue that comes up in home settings um, compared to kind of more standard clinical settings is how do you um, deal with hospitality? How do you respond to hospitality? Again, because you are coming into another person's home as a guest. And so, so you know, kind of consistently I, I receive offers of hospitality. People will offer you drinks. People want to show you something um, that is important to them and that is meaningful to them that will help them a lot of times communicate to you how the injury has impacted them and how the injury has impacted their family. And so kind of your responses to those those offers of hospitality, I think, are really key in establishing rapport. And I think finally, and you know, doing set, doing um, impl implementing research studies in the home setting really gives the researcher a stronger understanding of all the various family stressors. A lot of times, it's not just the injury. Um, people are experiencing significant financial stressors, medical stressors, stressors related to employment, um, social dysfunction, and also sometimes persons um, that we work with, their residence is not stable, so they may move around frequently. Again, it just gives us a little better understanding of what's going on. So now I kind of want to shift to speak um, a little bit about one of the studies that we're being that are that we're doing currently uh, in the home setting and speak a little bit about some cultural issues that have impacted the implementation of the intervention. So this is an intervention that we're doing, um, as I mentioned, in the home with a person who has sustained um, a traumatic brain injury um, and is having functional memory problems as a result of the brain injury. So for example, they're having trouble remembering things people tell them, remembering things that they need to do or want to do, remembering to take um, their medications as prescribed, remembering to you know take their important things with them when they leave the house, remembering things that have recently happened, um, you know remembering where they parked their car. Those are just some common examples of some um, functional memory problems that people are having. So with this particular intervention, as I mentioned, we're doing it in the home because that is where you know the people are experiencing the problems, and we feel like that would be the best match for this type of problem. And we're involving a caregiver, a family member, or a friend that the person with injury nominates to also participate in the study. Um, the, the other person is also involved in the intervention um, and is present for all in-person sessions because we want the family engaged and involved and so they can help support use of strategies when we're not there. So the first case I want to briefly talk about um, was about a, um, the participant was a middle-aged African-American man who returned to live with his elderly mother following his discharge from uh, inpatient rehabilitation. And one of the goals that we identified for him was improving his independence with medication management. At the time that I saw him, his mother was doing all of the medication management for him. She would set out the pills for him. She would wake him up when it was time to um, you know, take the pills. I mean, she was, in, you know, she was responsible for all aspects of that. Um, and again, so the, the goal again for him was to again to be more dependent with medication management, so he could do this without the reminders from the mother. And so the strategy that we were working on with him and his mother was uh, training in the use of a pillbox to try to get him to be more independent with use of these medications. Um, but there were issues with the implementation of the strategy, and some of them came or had to do with the mother's belief systems, her beliefs about her role as the mother and as the primary caregiver for her son. Um, so she was extremely reluctant to give up control of this medication management um, to, to, to let him try the, to use this pillbox with the, the way we had set it up. Uh, and also, um, you know, she was quite skeptical about the, the, the benefit, of, the potential benefit associated with this project and, and getting him to be more independent um, with this pillbox. And he, he did not have a return to, goal, return to work goal. I mean, he was just, you know, just living in the community. He was not going back to work. So some of the lessons that we learned from this particular um, case example was really, again, just the importance of understanding the family's experience and the family's roles, particularly the roles of the primary caregiver, and in terms of 
establishing support and reconciling that person's belief systems regarding her role as the mother and also kind of the family matriarch in terms of caring for her son with the re our rehabilitation goals of increasing independence. Uh, the next um, case example I want to talk about um, also was with the Memory Project. Um, and the person that has sustained an injury, he was, a, again, a middle-aged African-American man um, who, after injury, he was returning to live in the community in which he was raised. He had been kind of in and out in this community throughout his life. And he <clears throat> was returning to live um, with his parents. Since his injury, his injury really affected his ability to kind of navigate the computer his community. He had a lot of spatial problems and he had a hard time, um, you know, finding his way around and he would get very anxious about it. Um, at that point in time, he wasn't driving, but he did like to walk down to the park. He liked to walk to the store. He, he liked to walk around places in his neighborhood. But again, he was getting turned around, getting very upset. It would take him a lot longer to get places. Um, so the strategy that we were working on with him is was, you know, that we had initially um, developed was this kind of in vivo practice of roots. <clears throat> you know, and use of landmarks, <coughs> excuse me, in the community with their support. So our idea was that we would go out into the community with him and help identify um, landmarks and strategies and routes that he could then use so we could see what he was doing, where he was having big problems, and kind of help him problem solve about what would be the best way, most efficient way to learn these routes. Um, but there were some issues with implementation, and he was really um, reluctant to do this. And, you know, with continued questioning and, you know, about what was going on with him, again, because I knew it, it came out that he had significant concerns about how others in the community perceived him. Specifically, he was concerned that others in the community, if, if they saw him with us walking around, um, you know, these I know, you know, younger white woman with badges, um, that he would that he would be perceived as an easy target, um, as someone who could be taken advantage of, as someone who needed help, as someone who had a problem. Um, and so he was really kind of reluctant. It's not that he was not being compliant with the project or compliant with the goal, but the strategy as we had initially laid it out was not a good match for him. So and so in terms of the lessons learned, it was really helpful for us to understand his broader communicate his community and his concerns, his very realistic concerns regarding security. And again, when, to help put these beliefs in context, again, it had to do with his injury ideology. He was assaulted by unknown persons, and he had significant concerns that those persons um, were residents of that community. And again, he did not want to be perceived as a target. So that's an example of how, you know, I think what some initial reluctance, you know, how it could be perceived as, say, noncompliance when it was not that at all. But again, but really his beliefs about um, how he would be perceived by his community and the importance of being perceived as someone who was in control and who would not be taken advantage of. And the final example that I want to talk about today, um, um, again, with the Memory Project, and it was a, about a young, um, a young adult Hispanic male who was living with his mother following rehabilitation. Again, the, these, these mothers are their primary care, a lot of times the primary caregivers of um, um, these persons who have the brain injury. And his goal um, was remembering that we identified for him with the mother's input, was remembering to tell his mother when he was leaving the house and where he was going. Um, and this was a significant concern for the mom because he would just take off um, and not tell her where he was going or when he would be back. And so the initial strategy that we came up was kind of getting him to use, kind of leaving his mother reminder notes as part of his routine when leaving the house. Um, but there were, we had some implementation issues. And what came out, again, with, again, and this is what really became obvious when we were doing this in the home, is he had significant concerns that his mother was controlling him and preventing him from being a man. Um, this is the person who experienced significant losses as a result of his brain injury that negatively impacted his view of himself as a man, and that was very important to him. Um, he spoke about that often. Um, how he used to be and the, the amount of money he used to make and, you know, how he was independent and he had girlfriends, and but now he was unable to work. He was not able to live independently. And he was no longer able to care for his young children independently. So his mother had to step in and do all that because this person has significant cognitive and behavioral issues. But despite those significant cognitive and behavioral issues, it was still important for him, very important to him, to, for him to be seen as a man and to be treated as a man, not just by his family, but to others in the community. So, 
so what we did to kind of help him get buy-in with the strategy was really kind of incorporate aspects into the strategy development that would positively impact his sense of self in terms of what it meant to him to be seen as a man and control, greater control, again, into the strategy development. And finally, just I want to briefly talk about social communication. Um, social communication is how we use language. Um, and, and how we use language effectively really depends on the relationship we have to the other person and the setting in which we're talking. In other words, we communicate one way when we're speaking to someone we have a close personal relationship with, say a family member or a close friend, than we do with someone we have a professional relationship. You know, we communicate one way depending on if we're in a library, say, and we communicate a very different way, say, if we're at a baseball game. So, so effective social communication demands flexibility, demands adaptability to these kind of factors. Um, and another study that we were doing at our center had it was an intervention for social communication. And it was really important that we understood kind of people's cultural backgrounds because Social communication can be influenced by culture. So for example, things like eye contact, um, politeness rules, um, things like what, it, what one person may consider bragging, another person may consider exaggeration for, for, use of, for humorous effects. Um, and so we had to be very sensitive to people's cultural backgrounds, again, to make sure that we were not labeling something as, say, an impairment when it really reflected um, um, a cultural issue. And again, there's a lot of, um, again, to, to figure out, again, what is normal for that person um, in that setting. And then finally, as researchers, we need to be very sensitive um, to the fact that our priorities, um, as far as research, may not always match up with their priorities, their priorities in the home, their priorities with their family, with their job, and with their community. So as a recap of uh, today's talk, um, conducting culturally humble research requires commitment, self-reflection, and openness, and that we should treat uh, participant, the participant as the expert on his or her own life and experiences. And uh, remember that culture is more than just race and ethnicity. As we mentioned, it's um, uh, a lot of different things of uh, beliefs and uh, different characteristics. And then every aspect of research from the recruitment phase to the translation of the research can be impacted by uh, one's culture. And then partner with research staff from different or diverse cultural backgrounds and with diverse uh, communities uh, to help us develop and, and continue to have culturally uh, humble uh, research. Excellent. Here are the references that were highlighted on the slide. Um, and again, I'd like to thank you all for that very Im informative presentation and with our audience. And I'd also like to remind and encourage everyone to fill out the brief evaluation form at the bottom of the slide, and I'll email it to all who registered. This evaluation helps us to plan future events, and you can also ask your questions to the presenters and include your email address if you like them to get their answers back to you. We did apply for one hour of CRC CEUs for this webcast, and your evaluation is required for you to receive your verification of completion form if we are approved. I want to thank our presenters once again for their time in preparing this this presentation. And finally, I want to thank the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research for providing funding for this webcast. Again, again on behalf of our presenters and the staff at Tier Memorial Herman and myself and the rest of the KTTRR staff, thank you and have a good afternoon. <laughs>